San Francisco. Come on, make some noise. Let's kick it off this morning. Yes. And hello, world, watching on the live stream. Hello, and welcome to DockerCon 2018. Yes. Come on, let's hear it. You're probably wondering who this guy is. My name is Franco Finn. I am the hype man for the NBA champion, Golden State Warriors. How many Warrior fans in the house? Okay, we've got a handful. Fantastic. Fresh from a championship parade. I've been with the Golden State Warriors for 16 crazy seasons. Ups and downs. A lot of ups late, lately. It's been amazing. Uh, and so I'm also going to be the host to kick off DockerCon 2018. What's a hype man with the Warriors? I get 20,000 people hyped up on their feet each and every night at Oracle Arena. So if you ever come to Oracle, come say hi. I'm usually with the white sunglasses having some fun. But I'm going to bring some energy to DockerCon 2018. And of course, it's an honor for me to be right here in front of all of you and of course to come over here in San Francisco which is going to be the future home of the Warriors in a couple of seasons here and we're going to help out another hometown team Docker in uh, tipping off this big show and it is year number five folks at, at DockerCon and we're celebrating the journey but of course we're not just all about Docker's journey no 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 it's really all about you the fans indeed and it's time to ride that cable car into containerization glory so now without further ado i'm gonna put my big hype man voice here and introduce wrapping up his first year in docker blue our coach on the floor and i hear he's got a mean jump shot Please give a Golden State bo 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 welcome to Docker CEO Steve Sink. That was awesome. <laughs> wow. I've had some intros, but nothing like that. That was cool. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to DockerCon. Welcome to our beautiful hometown of San Francisco. You know, in this room, wow, there's a lot. There are 5,000 amazing innovators sitting right here in this room and tens of thousands joining us online. We're going to have an absolutely fantastic week. We're going to share some ideas. We're going to learn from one another. We're going to hear about new products and new projects. And of course, we're going to have some absolutely amazing demos. All with a simple effort to unleash innovation at a global scale. But that's just the beginning of what's cool about DockerCon. You know, five years ago, we bonded over this very simple idea, simple but powerful idea. Let's change the way the software is built and how it's shared. Docker was able to take this ingenious concept of a software container and make it accessible to everyone. And frankly, that changed everything. That actually brought us all together. And look, as we know, as we, every, everyone here knows, the beauty of a simple idea, particularly those that allow everyone to participate and everyone to benefit, is that it changes our reality. And that's rare. I've been doing this a long time, that's rare. But that's what we have together. Today, Containers are everywhere. Containers are Linux. But it'd be a narrow view of the world to assume that containers are just Linux. Containers are Windows. They're the data centers. They're in every single cloud. And over time, there are going to be billions of edge devices and chips literally integrated to every physical object in the world. And of course, these containers can run any kind of application. Whether you're talking about monolithic legacy applications, or next generation microservices, or Edge, or IoT, and frankly, the list will go on. Our focus in creating a formal standard for containers was driven by a singular goal. Let's unleash innovation at a global scale, and let's see what happens. And I got to tell you, did you folks deliver? The last handful of years have been absolutely amazing. You're creating new ideas, and you're sharing them in containers. In fact, in the past year alone, more than a million new developers 
started using Docker Desktop. You spun up more than a million new applications to share in Docker Hub. In fact, every two weeks, more than a billion containers that you've chosen to share are downloaded and used. In fact, about 50 billion to date. That is the beginnings of global scale, but it is, in fact, just the beginnings. And this is all made possible by you folks. Right? It's made possible by this community, the Docker community, the Kubernetes community, the serverless community, the Raspberry Pi community, frankly, communities that have yet to reach any kind of substantive scale, or for that matter, communities that haven't even come into existence yet. Right? Together, we're ushering in the next generation of computing. You're enabling, bless you, you're enabling, <laughs> the hearing's really good up here. <laughs> you're enabling a future of incredible opportunities. And this is what's fun about Docker. Now look, while our community is large, it's just getting started. Here's how I know that. Half of the folks in this room just started using containers in the past year. But you're not alone. Collectively, we've just scratched the surface. There are hundreds of millions of applications that run enterprises all around the world that can benefit from containerization. And in the years ahead, there'll be billions of microservices and applications that are going to be written, and they're going to be developed with the latest in machine learning and AI and blockchain and, frankly, other foundational elements of the next generation of software. In fact, 20% of the folks in this room just participated in Docker training over the past couple of days. Thank you very much, by the way. To all of you, thank you. On behalf of this entire Docker team, we are absolutely love being on this journey with you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I got one fan. <laughs> Look, over the past 25 years, I've been blessed to work with some incredible people to build enterprise applications right, that run, frankly, some of the largest companies in the world as well as some of the smallest companies in the world. Every year, in those 25 years, I felt like a kid in a candy shop. Right? Every year was an incredible opportunity to learn and, frankly, to contribute. But the changes that I've seen in just the past few years are more exciting than anything I've ever seen in the past. The nature of applications is changing. They're becoming intelligent applications. But it's more than that. Where technology innovation happens is also changing. Over the past 40 years, software innovation was largely driven by technology companies. Not entirely, but largely. Over the next 40 years, it's going to be the exact opposite. We're going to see more software innovation coming from the other 85% of the global economy than what we see from traditional software companies. From all of you, that are driving digital transformation within your own companies. But it's not just the idea that every company is going to be a software company. Of course that's going to happen. It's taking what you've done over the last several years and driving it to a global scale. It's sharing your innovations with others so they can leverage your innovations within their own innovations. It's a very different model of how we build applications. It's a very different model of how we build companies. We see a world in which every company will make their software available to the rest of the world to integrate within their products. And I would tell you the purpose of this community and the software that we're building together is to bring out and fundamentally unlock the innovation and the potential within every single company, within every single group, within all of us. That's our opportunity. Right? In fact, I would tell you, look, the reason that you're going to see innovation happen everywhere and be shared anywhere is because of you. That's what excites me about Docker. That's what's powerful about what we do together. So look, as the world moves to a model of distributed innovation and distributed consumption, we're going to need a few things. We're going to need a few things 
to enable that. First, we're going to need a container platform for distributed computing. We're also going to need an integrated tool set that delivers an absolutely delightful DevOps experience. And frankly, it needs you. It needs innovators that are going to push the bounds so that we as a global community can do more, so we can solve more problems, so we can actually create more opportunity. And frankly, so we can do this in collaboration with one another, so we can be additive to one another. When you combine that with the forward-thinking, innovative companies that are right here in this room, or those that are joining us online, that are embracing the enterprise container platforms that we deliver to drive either economic savings or to drive innovation, and guess what's going to happen? You're going to change the way we work. You're going to change our world. And that is ridiculously powerful. It, I will tell you, in the 25, 30 years now that I've been doing this, it is so rare to be in a community like that, to be in an environment where you have a chance to drive unbelievable change. That's what's cool about Docker. That's what's cool about this broader community. So, as we turn our attention to that future, to delivering a world-class container platform that we believe will be foundational to corporate IT strategies. That can make your digital transformation a reality. It's important to define our ethos, the core principles that will govern how Docker delivers its products and services. And for Docker, that ethos is anchored in three simple concepts, and is rooted in our corporate values. Three simple words: choice, security, and agility. That's the Docker promise. That's what we're committed to. The choice to run your applications wherever it makes sense, without lock-in. To be able to manage any application on any infrastructure. To allow your data to exist wherever you think it should exist. And to be able to manage all of that with a few simple clicks. Agility focuses on providing tools and integration. That enables your organization to be as real time on innovation as you'd like them to be. It's not just shrinking innovation cycles from nine months to multiple times a day. It's to enable teams to work together collaboratively, to drive the efficiency and the innovation that you're looking for, to go compete. And I will tell you, in an era where everything's going to have a digital representation, security has to be a basic digital right. It has to be part of the software we build. We have to know everything about the applications that we're running. We have to provide tools that govern how data that we create is used. And security is woven in every element of the Docker platform, everything from the engine all the way through to managing the entire software supply chain. That's our promise to you, and that's what's going to guide our innovations, and that's how we're going to serve you. So. Let's talk about how that promise translates to how Docker works for you. What are you going to get out of this this conference and our relationship going forward? For developers, Docker is committed to the tools to give you tools that give you an absolutely amazing experience, making things simple and fast, so you can focus on what you love: writing great product, writing great code. For the IT operations team, we're committed to an integrated platform. That allows you to deploy and run those great innovations in whatever model makes sense for your business, at whatever speed makes sense for your business, serving your customers with the SLAs that make sense for them. And we're going to work with your ar architects to make sure that we work within your methodologies and your critical technology stack, all as we collaborate and help you define the future of your technology stack. And lastly. For the business leaders that are in this room, you might be wondering, "Hey, how does a container work for my executive?" Well, look, you're gonna, the best examples of that will actually come from your peers, right here over the next few days. But we see Docker as the enabling platform to drive software innovation throughout your company, to help you define your future. That's what we see our role as. So no matter where you are in your journey, we're going to be there with you every step of the way. Whether you're working on your very first Docker project, 
or you're taking your legacy apps, moving them over to Docker and running them on any single, any public cloud you like, or you're building next generation applications that are going to be deployed on edge devices in the far corners of the world. We're going to be there for you every step of the way, because that's how we succeed together. Look, we know that every company, and show of hands for anyone who's not under pressure to innovate, but we know that every single company is under pressure to innovate and to lead their markets. We want to help you think big about where you're going and what you want to achieve. You know why? Because in the absence of knowing where you're going, you're going to come face to face with a quote from one of my favorite movie characters, Buckaroo Banzai. Show of hands, anyone know who he is? All right. <laughs> His, he uttered this quote in a very Zen-like style. He said, no matter where you go, there you are. <laughs> Your experience will be richer, and it's going to be far more rewarding if you know where you're going and what you want to get done. We can help you do that. Throughout this conference, you're going to hear how organizations are using Docker's container platform in ways that we couldn't have imagined three or four years ago. Everything from making craft beer to virtual reality to sending a rocket ship into space, to NASA actually shooting down asteroids that are headed towards Earth. By the way, they say thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> in our community theater, you're going to hear stories as diverse as Docker being used at, in MIT's Battle Code, which is an AI competition, or community service efforts within the Code for America Brigade. And it's being used in machine learning in popular video games, video games like Blizzard StarCraft II. Within the ecosystem, you're going to hear how different projects and our ecosystem partners are leveraging Docker for exciting work in areas like serverless, in areas like security, service mesh, and IoT. By the way, our ecosystem partners not only help make DockerCon happen, they're working alongside of you to usher in that next generation of compute. I encourage you to spend a lot of time with them over the conference, learn what they're doing, find out how we can work together. Additionally, our Docker Enterprise customers are going to share their stories. You're going to hear from Liberty Mutual. This is a 110-year-old insurance company that sees IoT as a critical part of their future. You're going to hear from the Boston Consulting Group that's redefining the ways delivering services to its customers through data science. And you're going to hear how the Lending Club literally 30-fold increased their business over the span of five years, disrupting a market that is rel relatively static, all using technology delivered by us, this community. There's absolutely unbelievable amount of, amount of information and content here at this conference. I encourage you to explore. I encourage you to leverage the experience of others and to define the future that you want to create. My teammates and I are here to help you make sure you get the most out of Docker and figure out how Docker can help you. So with that, let's tee up our first demo. It focuses on our promise of agility. Now, many of you are using the Docker platform to modernize traditional applications, giving them modern capabilities like a greater agility, security, and, and portability. But true to form, our community continues to push us. Many of you are also using the Docker platform to build microservices and next-generation applications. You are the innovators who know every single in and out of the Docker platform. You love pushing us. Well, together, we're going to innovate even faster on Docker Desktop, but always with an objective to keep things simple. Building tools that don't get in your way and that help you innovate at faster rates, that help you focus on the fun of creating. Now, over the past year, a million new users started using Docker Desktop. And from everything we can see, there'll be a million more joining in the next year. We want to make sure that the Docker Desktop experience delivers an absolutely delightful experience for you and every part of your team that's involved in taking incredible innovation and delivering it to your customers. So in combination, by the way, in combination with Docker Hub, this is really important, in combination with Docker Hub, Docker Desktop allows us to create 
and share our innovations as reusable applications. So we're excited to share with you some of the developer-focused innovation that our team's been working on. But before asking Gareth, Lily, and Mason to join me on stage, I want to do our traditional DockerCon sacrifice to the demo gods. There's a billion Indians that would disagree with that statement. <laughs> Now, I don't have my glasses, but I'm going to make this out. Have a whale of a time and make a splash. Seems cool. Thank you, everyone. Let's, let's welcome Gareth up to the stage. <laughs> okay, quick obligatory uh, blessing to the demo gods. Fortune favors the brave who present at DockerCon. Oh. It's a good job. So, okay, for developers, for developers like you all, it's all about the tools. In fact, I'd say we live in a golden age of developer tooling right now. Like you all have your own favorite text editor or IDE or programming language, and probably just as importantly, you have your least favorite tools too. Did you know, according to the Stack Overflow developer survey, the average developer uses around three different editors? Like personally, I'm a ma mainly a long-time Vim user. Um, oh, I thought there might be a few of you. Uh, it turns out I'm not alone. Uh, Vim is a lot more popular amongst DevOps folks like me than the sort of wider Stack Overflow developer population, for instance. Um, I, I, well, I think I know the answer to this question, but any other Vim users here today? Oh, uh, what about Emacs users? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> the most popular editors in the survey, though, were actually Visual Studio, VS Code, and Notepad++. Like, I'm generalizing there. Like, different types of developers use different tools. Like, that sounds obvious, but it's an important realization. The reality is that no one size fits all when it comes to developer tooling. Like, this, I guess, spectrum of different development tools and different types of developers is something we're thinking a lot of, about at Docker right now. Since the beginning, one of Docker's strengths was it, it didn't try to replace your existing tools. It complemented them. Like, Docker works for you. It's one of the reasons, I think, that Docker has seen such rapid adoption. By some estimates, there are 21 million professional software developers around the world. Um, and GitHub, ha GitHub has more than 28 million users. I'm sure most of the audience here today are part of that community. Like, what can we do to help, like, you and you and you and, like, all developers everywhere embrace Docker? A big part of the answer to that question is Docker Desktop. Like, and since its initial release, Docker Desktop has become like, an essential tool for a great many developers, irrespective of which other tools they happen to use. Like, in fact, we've seen more than one million new developers starting with Docker Desktop on Windows and Mac just in this last year. Like, Docker Desktop makes developing container-based applications on your local machine easy. Well, at least for a lot of us. So I just started working at Docker actually a few months ago. Um, but I've been using Docker for more than five years. Um, and I've been using Docker Desktop since its initial release. I've worked as a software developer, a technical architect, an occasional systems administrator. And I'm definitely an early adopter of new technology. And I've spent an awful lot of my working life on the command line. I bet there's a lot of people in the audience who say exactly the same. Like, as early adopters, we often prefer command line tools because it makes integration easier. But I've also worked with like really good developers and operators for whom the command line was definitely actually a barrier to entry. Like, the reality is graphical user interfaces can be powerful and productive too. Like, 
a well-designed graphical interface can often help you achieve your goal like, with the minimum of fuss, especially when learning a new tool. Like, after five years with Docker, we also know lots of the best practices around containers. Like, we need tools that encapsulate those and make getting started with Docker even easier. I'm sure there are people in the audience who know like, all of the Docker subcommands by heart. Um, I won't ask you how many of them they are. Uh, but for everyone else getting started, creating a Docker application today means learning a number of new things. And you'll be writing Docker files and Compose files. And you'll probably spend a fair amount of time with the reference documentation. I mean, did you know that the Docker file and Compose file references are two of the most popular pages on Docker.com? If you're not already familiar with the command line, and that ends up being a lot of things that you need to learn. So imagine if you could Dockerize your first application like, without writing those text files or using the command line. Imagine saving time by starting with templated applications, like, like all based on the community best practices. And imagine being able to share like, those and collaborate with your team on them easily, all from within Docker Desktop. So I'm, we'd be taking a tool that's already easy to use for those of you with command line superpowers and making it even easier to consume for all developers. Let's see a quick demo of something we've been working on. Like, here's Lillian Mason. Hey. O ye demo gods, please accept this humble offering. The container you seek is in another container. Huh, interesting. Hey, did you just join the company? Oh, hi, yeah, I'm Mason. I'm a new developer here. Hi, I'm Lily. Welcome. Thanks. Actually, I'm looking for my manager, a Mr. Marx. Do you know where I can find him? Uh, oh, there he comes, actually. Mason, Mason, great to see you. Welcome on board. Oh, thanks so much. Glad you're here. Um, unfortunately, we have a bit of a situation. Um, our largest customer um, has given us a urgent project, and uh, if we don't complete it on time, they'll cancel all of our contracts. So um, please uh, drop everything, both of you, and get to work on this right away. Sorry. <laughs> wow, things are really agile around here. Tell me about it. Anyways, what is this app? Uh, looks like we need to build a web app to showcase the client's music catalog. OK. And what are the specs? So the application itself needs to be written in ASP.NET Core. OK, we can do that. Looks like the database needs to use Microsoft SQL Server. OK. And uh, the infrastructure, we want to set it up in a load-balanced Azure cluster. Oh, and the services need to run on Docker. I'm actually not familiar with Docker yet, so I think you might have to handle that part. Actually, I haven't gotten around to learning Docker either. That's OK, though. We can take a couple of days, you know, read some docs, do a couple of tutorials. We'll figure it out. Okay. Anyways, so with all of that, and then building the app, writing unit tests, integration tests, setting up QA, setting up production, I think we can get a, something ready in a couple of weeks. Uh, what does it say the deadline is? Like end of Q2-ish? 8 p.m. 8 p.m.? Yep, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. today. Today. That's, that's not possible. I mean, this client has had other crazy asks, but this is literally impossible. Okay, okay let, let's not panic. Uh, let's just take this one piece at a time. Um, let's just start with the Docker part and go from there. Okay, you're right. You're right. Let me just get started by doing some research on Docker. There, I found something. Oh, yeah, here we go. All right, so. Here's an answer. It looks like if we run... Oh, yeah. That's not going to work. It's... it's okay. There's another answer here. Everything you could ever know about containers, that's promising. Well, that's a nice diagram. Okay. Some examples. There's another diagram. This is a lot. There's another diagram. Some of this doesn't even look that relevant. OK, another diagram. That's a lot. 
I don't know. I'm starting to freak out a little bit. I think there's no way we'll get this done today. Maybe we should just give up right now. And wait a second. There's one more response here. It looks like Docker Desktop comes with a tool that will set this up for us. It's part of the menu. We just click on Design New Application. Okay. I doubt it'll handle everything for us, but you're right. It's worth a shot. So I go to Design New Application. Oh, this looks promising. Let's uh, let's check out the templates and see if that has something we can use. Okay, looks like there's some very useful templates here, but they don't really match what we need. So let's go back and create a custom application. All right. So if we're doing it that way, we need to start with the ASP.NET Core service. Okay. I'll just leave it at port 8080 for now. Okay. Oh, actually, it specifically requests port 61793. That's unusual. Ah, uh, don't even get me started. Once that same client insisted on port seventy thousand. Seventy thousand, you can't. It's out of the range of. I know. The, uh, I know. Uh, okay. All right. Seven nine three. Okay. What else? All right. For the database, we need to use Microsoft SQL Server. Okay. Very good. And that should do it. I think we can just continue. And what does it say to name the app? Project Woodstock. And let's try assembling it. All right, this looks good. Mm -hmm. Both. Should we just run it? Yeah, let's say run. Okay, looks like it's building the containers. The ASP.NET. Okay. And there's the database. Wait, there's no way this just works, right? Well, let's go to the URL we exposed and see if it does. Okay. That's the ASP.NET default page. It worked. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> so using Docker Desktop, we managed to uh, set up all of the Docker infrastructure for our new application in just minutes. What's next? Well, I guess now we need to write the app. Let me just open the project. Okay. Looks like I can just open it in Visual Studio. There. Nice. I think we're all set to start coding then. Let's do this. Square to three, Princess Celestia. It does not exist. Definitely not. Okay, and done. Whew. We've been at this for hours. How's your part coming along? I just finished, but I haven't tried running it yet. Plus, I still need to write unit tests, integration tests. Mm -hmm. Yep. Alrighty. Did well, I hear I that it worked. It worked. Oh, uh, are well. You, are you ready? It, it it should work. We we haven't actually tested this out yet, but oh yeah, it is a PM. All right, let's give it a shot. Let's see what you got. All right, so we're going to go back and start this up again. All right, cross your fingers. Looks like it's building. Oh, and there's ASP.NET. Let's go to the same URL, local 61. It worked? It worked! It worked! <laughs> All right. Now you're sure this is all using Docker, right? Uh, yes, sir. We used Docker Desktop to set up all the Docker infrastructure right from the beginning. Wow. It was actually really easy. The whole thing took us a couple clicks. That's so great. I'm I'm really glad that you all are such Docker experts now. It's, that's fantastic because the um, same client has given us another urgent project. And um, sorry. <sighs> and when is this one due? Eight. AM. <laughs> All right, let's do this.
We've only been able to show you a quick demo, obviously, today. And we showed creating a brand new application in just a few clicks. We showed how you can choose from pre-built templates of common stacks or build up your own set of services from scratch. And we showed how you can build and run your application all without touching the command line. And we also have lots of ideas for other features and enhancements here, too. The most interesting area to explore is definitely around collaboration. And being able to share templates with others on your team, like being able to enforce your company policies like on what tech stack you want to use, and being able to integrate with your existing CI CD system, all from Docker Desktop. Making Docker accessible to a wider range of developers is, is hopefully something we'll come back to time and time again. And if you have ideas on that sort of theme, definitely let us know. If you're interested in getting early access to creating applications in Docker Desktop, then please sign up at beta.docker.com. And if you'd like to see more, then I look forward to seeing you at the Docker for Developers talk on the Docker 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 track this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, good job. That was awesome, especially the Mountain Dew. I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you how excited I am about the work we're doing around Docker Desktop. We're committed to delivering an absolutely delightful DevOps experience. Okay. By the way, I, I would ask you to please come back tomorrow uh, for the closing session. You're going to see the folks from Kubeflow, um, from the Kubeflow project, and they're going to demo how they use Docker Desktop with their uh, machine learning uh, uh, software. Look, of course, m many of the developers that are working in our community are also working for some of the leading companies in the world. Over the past year, we've doubled the Docker Enterprise Edition family to over four, uh, 500 commercial customers, many of which are actually right here in this room. To all of our customers, on behalf of my Docker teammates, thank you very much for the trust that you put in us. Our customers use the Docker Enterprise Edition to, ad to address a number of IT challenges. Okay? But whether it's to modernize traditional applications, or migrate applications to the cloud, or build next generation applications or edge applications, they see the Docker container platform as a central part of their IT strategy. One platform to build, ship, run, and manage all of their applications on any operating system, on any infrastructure. Docker is a strategic bet to drive their digitization strategy, to drive their future, and we're honored to be your partners. Today, we have, we're excited to have a local company join us here on stage and share their story. McKesson is a $200 billion healthcare company, and it's going through an amazing transformation of itself, on its own. McKesson is embarking on a multi-year IT strategy to digitize their entire pharmaceutical supply chain and empower their software developers. We're lucky to have two of their leaders that are driving that, that transformation here today. Please join me in welcoming Rashmi Kumar and Andy Zitney to the stage. Rashmi, Andy. <laughs> nothing screws up too bad. All right, modernize from the monolith, turn yesterday into tomorrow. Oh, wow, couldn't be a better topic for us. Right on, for yeah. us. Thanks, Steve, for setting the stage up for us and your um, opening um, address to the team. So McKesson, who, who we are, um, let's cover this. Since I knew this company first time in 2011, um, I think we are the largest fortune company, um, which is kind of unknown to most of the people. This year in 2018, we are number six, um, 205 billion in revenues, 185 year old actually, we completed 185 years this year. One third of the prescriptions um, in this country, the pharmaceuticals is delivered by us. Um, we are global in 16 different countries, um, 3.7 billion um, cash flow, um, just global reach across all segments of healthcare. Uh, we are talking about pharmaceutical distribution, medical, surgical, retail, 
Um, you know, when, when I, after knowing McKesson, when I started going to the hospitals, I started noticing the um, symbol. It was, it was so amazing to, to see us at so many different places. Um, as Steve talked about, every company has to change and evolve. Um, why is the rise of the consumerization? The way we interact with the technology today has changed um, tremendously. And I was amazed. I've been in many, many different industries, utilities, financial services, auto, entertainment. Um, guess what? Banks exchange data across countries globally. Um, electric utilities deregulated because there is data exchanges set up and information is readily available. It doesn't happen in healthcare, something on which all of our lives depend on. And now we are asking for that to, to companies like um, our providers, our doctors, our pharmacists, our, our, our payers and insurance company. And McKesson as a company, we realize we are sitting at that intersection um, of all players in healthcare and we can make it happen for our patient. It does change, it does change how we think internally and that's why our um, CEO got out to the street a couple of months ago and announced this multi-year initiative where we said that we'll focus on three growth priorities and those are really helping our manufacturers with their launch services, their clinical trials, their ability to keep patients on the treatment um, and, and then make it better for them to discover new drugs and, and bring it to the people who really need it. Enhanced solutions for specialty pharmaceuticals. It was also on the last slide. Specialty is the largest uh, growing segment of pharmaceutical. And it changes the way we deliver treatment to our patients today. Um, till 10 years ago, um, cancer was maybe 10 different variations. Now it has 300 different variations. With immunotherapy, with CAR T, we need different capabilities to bring those treatments to our, our, our patients and make it uh, better for them. Also, new offering to, and to strengthen our retail pharmacy. We are one of the largest um, retail pharmacy, brick and mortar uh, store owner in the, in the world. And how do we still create our customers, um, which are more B2B, but enable them to deliver better uh, product and services to our end, end patients? How we, will, um, how we will fund these growth initiatives? And the idea was when we say IT, finance, and human resources is to direct our funds and, and our, our, our resources to technology innovation enabled by the right level of people and resources to be able to deliver these uh, product and services to our customers. So as I, as I say, John says this very well, better business health creates um, better patient health. And as we see the patient in the middle, as we see with the technology growing, e-commerce growing, um, frictionless customer experience growing, still pharmacy has a place, health systems has a place, manufacturers have a place in, um, in making a patient's life better. Being a B2B company, 185 years old, how we change that mindset internally and be able to deliver that product and services to our customers through our channels of pharmacies. So if you look at the pharmacies today, um, and these are the brands across the globe, 15,000 stores, how do we enable them better um, to be able to serve our customers with all the um, services that we talk about? So if, uh, just high level, if you look at what does the supply chain means, how do we renovate the pharmacies and the experience that we as a customer have with them, um, both in the click and the brick mode? Um, these are some of the things that um, today a pharmacy offers um, to a customer, and what we offer to the, to the pharmacy. Some of the examples, like franchising and banner programs, enables pharmacists um, to focus more on their patients, and we take away the headache of all the commercial and the back office aspects of them. Clinical services, a lot of patients don't want to go to a health system setup or an emergency room. What if you could walk in and see a doctor in a, in a, in a pharmacy? Um, as well as, um, consulting to them to run their businesses better and things like that. All these needs some kind of a technology um, presence at the pharmacy and the patient's intersection. The technologies that create these low-cost order setting for our, our customers to get services um, needs online doctor, expanded pharmacy services, order management for the pharmacy, um, handling both um, Individual, individual e-commerce to pharmacy um, supplies and the hospital supplies, 
all at the same time, omnichannel presence. These are the needs which are kind of shaping how we think about the technologies, um, what we have today running our business. But guess what's there right now? We talked about monolith in our, in our what Fortune Cookie said. Um, we have 20-year-old ERP systems, 30-year-old, we have a patent on that, a supply chain system, and we have an uh, e-commerce system. Um, I'm talking about one business unit, U.S. Pharma, which is in itself $155 billion. E-commerce system is almost 15 years old. Um, they run our business, but they're not agile enough. We cannot bring in these new capability and functionality to our pharmacy customer, health system customer, or the end customer, the patient, um, in a way that it's, it's necessary. To be able to do that, I'll use this example, how Docker kind of walked into our shop, was uh, four years ago, we decided to re-platform our um, e-commerce system. It runs our 70% of our orders at $150 billion, and we had taken over um, the implementation five years ago with a business plan. The only need was technology refresh. It wasn't bringing any new additional value. It was just the technology because it could not take any more changes. What we had, I joined then as an architect, and I started looking at it. IT, we built an IT strategy, cloud first, data analytics, customer experience, security. Guess what we were doing? We were spending millions of dollars in building another e-commerce system which would sit in my data center for the next 20 years. How do I future-proof it as an architect? That was the challenge. Four years ago, Docker was just coming up. Kubernetes wasn't open source. There was no management platform. We started tweaking and trying and started engaging with Docker. I, we kind of grew with it. The, way, the day Docker Data Center came out, um, we were like, yes, we want it. <laughs> we had our partner um, uh, in, as the system integrator, and Docker worked together to create a proof of concept. Convincing initially was difficult because I was trying, trying top down. I went in bottom up, showed the um, administrator. At that time, even now, the legacy e-commerce takes uh, somewhere four to five weeks to build a new environment. Guess what? With blue-green deployment, upgrades, 15 minutes, 14 minutes to build a new, 45 minutes to build a new environment, even being conservative. The admin was brought in. So I'm going to transition to Andy with a message that it takes a culture change, it takes strategy, it takes people training to come to something like this. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmi. So if, so if you didn't pick up from Rashmi, we're really old, right, 185 years old. Um, which means there's 185 years of stuff that we're trying to address in this strategy. Um, so it isn't just Greenfield. It's not the perfect world where we can just build net new. There's this legacy. So we, we had to take that into consideration. and You'll see how Docker fits into this strategy. We really took a look at the addressable market of who we were trying to enable with uh, platforms and tools like Docker and bringing them into the environment. And we really centered around the developer, giving the developer superpowers, letting them drive the business, right? Doing it at a, a pace that McKesson hasn't seen in its 185 years. Um, but then we found something out as we went through this process, right? We're still 18 months into it, so I'm somewhat into the beginning of a, a transformation of, of the company. Um, but to kick it off, we really had to focus on, okay, so what's out there, right? What's our process? What are we gonna do? What's the problem? What are we trying to solve for? Rashmi mentioned we're, the product set of the business is changing rapidly. We're going from B to B predominantly to B to C. The expectation of that B to C, that consumer, the rate of change has to happen at a much more rapid pace. You have to enable the devs to be able to deliver a product almost in the same day it's conceptualized. We're nowhere close to having an environment to do that because of the legacy. So we had to go out and go through somewhat a formal process of the discovery, what's out there from a pipeline perspective, how do we ship code across all these different federated development teams. So as we were discovering, it was a lot like, I don't know, trenching a ditch, um, a lot of digging. Um, and not a lot of good discovery, but a lot of discovery. You found out you had a federated model that had BUs around the world, um, that had sub-BUs in regions. The development teams were organized that way. 
they really didn't have any kind of synergies across the board or common tool sets or any kind of sharing or any collaborative environment to develop anything going forward. So that was the first step in the process of discovery. Then we started having conversations around what about a pipeline like CICD capabilities and automation on the deployment side and everything else. And we found very little, if anything. It's like standing in an empty cave. There wasn't a lot of stuff there. A lot of code, a lot of people writing stuff, all different, different platforms. And in a lot of cases, it wasn't even our employees. We were doing third parties to develop some of this code base. So we didn't have the developers in-house to even build on it in this environment. Then we took a look at, okay, so how do they ship code? And it was pretty much like dragging a ship across dry land. It took them way too much time, right? And for a developer, I'm not telling you guys anything, for a developer, when you're doing something that you, and you're not writing code, you get frustrated. They get very upset about it, right? Because it should be easy. It should be easy to please the business and the consumer. And this is the last step in that process. And they're fighting every step of the way. Anyway, so that's the, sort of the good picture of where we were. And even where we had some of the POCs going, Rashmi mentioned we brought Docker in. It still wasn't rolled out at scale, so it was independent teams taking a look at it, and we were doing it almost use case by use case, environment by environment. And we quickly realized we had to grow this into something to scale and enable the developers in a much different manner. So the journey began probably 18 months ago. We pulled everything in, we kicked off a couple of key projects, some major initiatives, brought the environment in, took a look at, all right, so now we have an enabling force with Docker, right? We have a platform that takes the devs and they love it. It's easy use, right? You got to see in the demo, it's easy use, it is that easy. Now they're not wasting time anymore, they're not standing, now they have started having conversations in and around what to share. So we started to build ourselves a bit of a strategy, sort of like the million points of light conversation. They're still all independent, they're all over the place, but we at least have them talking what I'll say is the same language now. And they have the same goal. Fully automated stack. Stop doing, I think I gave one speech, I said shaving the yak, right? All this stuff that developers don't like to do, I refer to it as shaving a yak, right? It's meaningless work setting up an environment, doing the configuration. That's not what a developer's paid to do. They're, they're paid to write business language code. Please the customer, please the business. We started to get the teams thinking that way and put the light or the dots out there. Now we just had to get them connected a little bit more. They started sharing. What's interesting about it is a platform like Docker and some of the tools around it and putting the power in the developer's hands, they start to self-organize. They start to talk to each other. They find out where the gaps are and they discuss those gaps. They start saying, let's share some information. Let's share some code. Let's get this organized, no matter what BU you're in now and you're on a platform, we now have something that they can do in common and start building on top of. So then we step back and said, okay, this is great. We have an empowering environment. Docker's in the center of this conversation. We have an environment now that we can do things different. So let's start thinking different. Let's create a theory of McKesson Labs. Put the collaborative platform in the middle of it. Allow these teams, even though they're not reorganized into any kind of organization structure and realigned underneath particular managers and everything, they're in the same environments now. They share information, they share a code base, they're starting to get common platform across the board. We're long way from Nirvana here, but we started to get the baseline in place. And you're starting to see the teams that before worked independently start to discuss sort of the future and the next steps of this. And it is very empowering for the developers from a self-organization and collaboration perspective with Docker as a key ingredient to delivering this whole thing globally. We mentioned the monolith. As we were doing all of this, what I presented there was a lot around Greenfield because we did have some major efforts where we did have some Greenfield. So it was, it was a bit of Nirvana. We, we had a good environment. It was clean. It was a lot easier to implement. But we're a 185-year-old company with some code bases that have 
purchase packages and 60,000 customizations on top buried in the code base, no concept of microservices. So we had to build a process that we could take those legacy systems through, take a look at them and start unwinding some of them and really classify them. And this is representative of how we're thinking of doing that. The key point being Docker sits in the middle of this. We now have an environment where we can take some of those not so good apps, not written real well, and just containerize it. Let's set it on a shelf. We're going to run it. We know that. Just containerize it and protect yourself from it. The other ones, we can bring it into a new pristine environment, rewrite. And then that new, obviously, it's cloud first, Docker first type of transformation. So what are we seeing early on? A lot of people ask about the cost. My comment is cost comes out of the back end no matter what, right? Um, don't pay attention to the cost. It'll happen. It's a trust me conversation, right? It's always good to go to your CFO, just trust me, don't worry <laughs> about it. it. Works all the time. Um, it really is centered more around the agility, the speed, and pleasing the customer and the business. And as you do that on a platform like Docker and you start automating things like QA and testing and shifting left and getting security down at the lowest level in the development pipeline, all of a sudden all those testing QA teams, all that other overweight that you used to, overhead that you used to have goes away. And Docker enables you to do that and start transforming the way you write code, the way you deliver code, and how automated it is. Then the cost comes out. Stability goes up. Maintenance goes down. So what we learned from our experience so far, it wasn't about the 2,000 devs. It was about the 5,000 IT people, because now your infrastructure people change. Everybody in and around the development environments change. The developer's in the middle. This is still about giving the developer the superpowers. They run the business. They drive the business. The Docker platform enables us to move at speed, but now everybody has to move with us. We're early on. We saw some great indicators of the success. What I would say is, invite me back next year and we'll tell you what exactly happened. I think this number goes from 5,000 to some subset of the entire company. And I'm not saying Docker drives all that, but to make it successful and move at speed, the business process and everything has to come along. And for the first time in a long time, we're driving that conversation at speed, agility, and the transformation. So with that, thank you for your time. Thank you. I didn't trip. I didn't do anything. Thank you. Rashmi, thank you so much. That was awesome. Please join me in another round of applause for Rush, me and Frandy. It's always inspiring to hear how individuals can lead to such a massively impactful transformation, not just for their development organization, but as you also heard, for their IT organization. And through that, for a Fortune 10 company. That's amazing. So I want to spend a few minutes on this promise of choice. McKesson's success and frankly, that of every one of our customers is enabled by choice. Choice for the developers, for operators, for architects, in the tools that they use, the operating systems that they run, and the infrastructure that is best suited to meet their needs. Nearly every company, every single company that is using the Docker platform is running on a hybrid cloud strategy. That means multiple public clouds, multiple internal data centers, and as you're going to hear from many of our customers, it also means edge devices. As you heard from McKesson, choice is critical as you think about how you can operate in, a in what is becoming a digitized pharmaceutical supply chain. Now, we all know that the cost of internal data centers is going up. In fact, it's going up at rates faster than GDP. So it makes perfect sense to leverage some, leverage public clouds for either some or all of your uh, enterprise applications. All that, of course, is dependent upon your business needs. In fact, many of you first embrace Docker because it's a great way to move your applications, whether it's legacy or um, uh, next generation applications, moving them to the cloud. Choice allows you to run your applications wherever you wish to run them. 
or for that matter, change the clouds you're using. Move your applications one cloud to another cloud as your business needs evolve. Now, when you read everything that's going on in this marketplace, there's a lot of confusion. Every single cloud tells you that they use Docker and tells you they use Kubernetes. And then, of course, they're going to use the next open source technology that adds value to containers. Containers might be portable, but the management of containers is not. What we hear from our customers is they want agility, they want security, and they want choice. Choice in how you develop your applications and a simple way to manage all of your applications across any operating system and across any infrastructure. Ideally, from a single pane of glass. And you know what? That's actually a reasonable request. It's totally reasonable to say, make this easy for me. Let me, show, let me ask a couple of folks to come on stage and show you how choice is a central theme in the Docker Enterprise Edition. Please join me in welcoming Docker's Chief Product Officer, Scott Johnson, to the stage. Scott? <laughs> Don't get the hug. <laughs> a hug from your boss and a fortune cookie for breakfast. The, the day is only going to get better from here. Right? All right. See the whale, be the whale. Very, very zen. Hello, DockerCon. Do you like what you see so far? How many, how many were at the first DockerCon? Raise your hands. It's only about 300 of us. All right, can I have a round of applause for them? Um, four years, four years collaborating, contributing, participating, engaging, building up this community to where we are today. Now let's go to the other end. For how many here is this their first DockerCon? Raise your hand. All right, a round of applause for them as well. We're starting to engage with the community, to contribute. And for everyone in between those two endpoints, like this is the time to share stories, to bring new perspectives, and DockerCon is the great, great venue for that. All right, so let's jump in. You heard Steve talk about how choice is one of the core promises of Docker. And in talking with many of you, we hear there's, there's two dimensions of that that are particularly important. One is the choice for any application, any workload type, and then the ability to run that on any infrastructure using one platform. And we hear this requirement for choice across all participants, all contributors to the software development lifecycle to build, ship, and run great applications in your organization. And why is that? That is because choice empowers them to use the right tool for the right job for them to accomplish their objectives. For example, for your developers, they want choice of language, workload type, and third-party tech. They want to be able to use any language that gives them productivity, functionality, collaboration to get the job done, Within your lines of business, you have developers responsible for 10-year-old legacy apps, new microservice-based apps, big data apps, edge apps. And so they want the choice to deploy any workload type onto that platform. And finally, your developers, in building their applications, want to take advantage of innovation outside the four walls. They want to take advantage of services from the public cloud providers. They want to take advantage of new open source projects. And maybe they want to take advantage of partner technologies. All together so that they can make the best choices, the best applications for your business. But on the other side of the application lifecycle, IT ops requires choice as well to achieve their objectives. They want to take advantage of innovation at every layer of the infrastructure stack, at compute, network, storage. They want to be able to take costs out of the operations 
while simultaneously giving you more capacity and capabilities. And finally, they want to be able to deliver the first two, deliver innovation, leveraging innovation, and deliver cost takeout while not becoming locked in to any particular technology or, in a, or any particular technology vendor as they engineer and operate infrastructure that enables the business. So ops requiring choice can lead to a lot of complexity, a lot of heterogeneity in the environment. Some examples, whether it's in computer architectures, x86, ARM, mainframe, whether it's different flavors of networking and storage, different considerations of infrastructure from bare metal to virtualization in the data center to public clouds. And of course, there's always a plethora of operating systems to consider. In fact, for those who are deploying containers, and I hope that's most in this room, right? OK. 90% of, almost 90% of you are saying you're deploying containers onto multiple operating systems. How many? Well, you're telling us that the number of operating systems you're deploying containers onto is, on average, 4.1, because math. Moreover, just over half of you are saying you're deploying containers onto both Windows and Linux servers. And this is why, from the beginning, we designed Docker Enterprise Edition to give customers flexibility and choice of the operating systems where they run their containerized apps. And Docker Enterprise Edition is the only enterprise container platform that supports this range of operating systems. In fact, we were the first and are still the only one to offer production support for Docker containers on Windows. Starting in September 2016, when the Docker Enterprise Engine shipped with Windows Server 2016, and then again last August, when the full Docker Enterprise Containers as a Service stack shipped for Windows Server. And this is why we're really excited to share this morning some great updates on Docker and Windows. Now, Docker and Windows is a big community, and of course, there's no, there has been no bigger collaborator with us than Microsoft. To share more, please join me in welcoming to the stage Microsoft Corporate Vice President of Windows Server, Aaron Chappell. All right, I'm excited to be part of this uh, Docker tradition. All right, I think we're continuing the Zen. Some pursue happiness, you contain it. Oh, that's a good one. We just, we dropped the mic there, right? <laughs> so good to see you, Aaron. It's so good to see you. Uh, it's amazing to think about four years ago we started this journey together that led us to this stage. Hard to believe. It is, and I'm so proud of not only the work we've been able to accomplish together, but how we've been able to do it. And that's thanks to not only our partnership, but the partnership with this community Absolutely. here in the room. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, when we started Containers within Microsoft, we weren't sure exactly the path that was going to lead us here to where I am today. Mm -hmm. um, but it was clear to us that the connection, the collaboration, and ultimately creating with the community, you know, had to be different than what we'd done before. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's been really exciting to take the platform experience of, of Microsoft, combine it with the enterprise and the developer experience at Docker, um, and then take the requirements, the contributions, the collaborations, feedback of the community to really be able to, as Steve said earlier, push us in a direction where we are able to deliver at the agility that this industry needs at this time. That's right. Yeah. And that combination has really enabled us to extend the benefit of containers to not only enterprise and uh, in the developers, but also IT, mm -hmm. uh, not only on-premises, but in the cloud, Windows and Linux, and looking at legacy applications, as well as building cloud-ready, sort of more microservices-based applications of the future. Lots of sources for customers. Exactly, and that consistent platform underneath really you know, brings power to this innovation. And so we, we, you know, we just, you know, have a great foundation to build on. We do, and I think one of the, the fruits of that, or one of the uh, many fruits of that, Aaron, has been in the last 12 months alone, we've seen over 500,000 downloads of Docker wow. Desktop for Windows, right? Wow. Very exciting. And that is developers, IT pros, and DevOps engineers all using it to build both yeah. Windows and Linux containers on their laptops. Wow. It's very exciting. Wow. And, you know, you talk about what we see on the Windows, on the, on the client side, the desktop side, um, but if we think about just going into the enterprise, one of the things that enterprises require is enterprise-grade stability and mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. And that was why in Windows Server 2016, when we launched, we included the, the basic version of, of Docker EE mm -hmm. for our customers at no additional charge, mm -hmm. uh, so that they could really benefit from that enterprise-grade support that Microsoft and, and Docker right. provide. Right. Um, and, you know, really that has been the, you know, containers have been part of the, the momentum that we've seen with Windows Server 2016. It's actually our fastest adopted server OS release to date. Congratulations. Yes, thank you so much. And, you know, as I said, containers are behind that. And in addition to Windows Desktop, on the Windows Server side in the last year alone, we've also seen 500,000 downloads of Docker EE as well. Congratulations. That's Thanks. outstanding. It's amazing. Um, and, you know, really it's not a surprise in many ways. When you think of almost 80% of applications today in the enterprise touch Windows in some way mm -hmm. or, or form, it's really important for us. Most of those are actually on Windows Server 2008 or 2012 uh, instances of server. It's, no, you know, it's our um, job to really provide enterprises with that bridge to be able to, you know, preserve the investment they have in traditional apps, help move them forward, but also then and provide the platform to create new modern applications and, and deliver at the agility that businesses need and, and be cloud ready. That's right. Uh, and it really is the, the combined platform that we see across Windows Server and in our partnership with Docker EE that whether or not that application is a traditional lift and shift, a new application being written again, Linux or Windows on-premises or in the cloud, or hybrid, as we see many of our customers really looking at adopting the future. That consistency of platform is really important. And so, you know, Windows Server 2016 was just the beginning of this journey, mm -hmm. right? Since then, Windows Server has, has moved to a semi-annual channel release. And really, we're learning from the open source community about what it means to experiment, to iterate, and then ultimately deliver at the pace, right, that right. this industry demands. And so, you know, this enables us to also better support our partners, but also the open source community to deliver at that agility uh, that is required. And so I'm excited that one of the places where we've extended that collaboration is into the Kubernetes project. And it's our commitment to, we're working now in the Kubernetes project to extend the same support level for Windows as already exists for Linux. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited that, you know, today we have over 70% of the K8 conformance tests passing on with Windows, the Windows platform mm. across desktop and server. Great. Um, and we have line of sight to, you know, uh, completing that work. And so I look forward to, to being able to share shortly that we've passed all the validation across the desktop and server platforms. Absolutely. And I'd encourage you all to, to engage in our Windows and Windows Server Insiders program to check that out for yourself and provide us with feedback on how we're going. Excellent. Yeah, and this not only provides value to the community, but I know it's been really important in, in our relationship and That's our right. partnership for Docker to be able to then build on top of that foundation. That's right, and thank you, Aaron, for that partnership. And together with you and your team at Microsoft, as well as the community, yeah. 
um, we're giving our customers even more choice by announcing this morning here at DockerCon that we are bringing support for Windows Server and Kubernetes into Docker Enterprise Edition. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, how about we take a look at a preview of what's coming? I would coming? love to see All it. All right, great. Let's welcome to the stage Daniel Hilkin. All right, you guys ready for a demo? Demo. All right, let's see. Uh, change the mindset and follow the culture with, with will follow. All right, let's That's see how one. that goes. All right. Well, they're all set for a second round of demos, Daniel. How are right. you feeling? Feeling good? Yep. All right. OK, so let's start out talking a little bit about the app we're going to use for this demo. Um, now, what we've got is an ASP.NET 2.0 web application. Uh, now, this repre represents roughly a 13-year-old technology stack. Mm. <laughs> so we've got a monolithic <laughs> web app sitting on top of a Microsoft SQL Server backend. Um, now, when you deploy a multi-tier application on Docker Enterprise, you have a couple choices to express that multi-tier application. Now, if you know that you're going to be deploying exclusively to Kubernetes, you can use the Kubernetes YAML formats to express that application. Um, but if you'd like some more flexibility in your choice of orchestrator, you can use the Docker Compose format. So Docker Compose will let you uh, target both Swarm and Kubernetes uh, orchestration. So we're, for this demo, we're going to go ahead and use a Compose file. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at what that Compose file looks like. So I'll bring that up here. Um, so we can see, again, it's a pretty simple two-tier application. Um, we've got both of the layers, or both of the components in this application are built on top of Windows Server container images. So this application is going to have to stand up on Windows Server. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the cluster where we're going to deploy this app. So let me go ahead and log in here. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at the nodes in this cluster. OK, so as you can see, Docker Enterprise Edition gives you choice. We have choice in operating system. So we've got nodes in this cluster running both Linux and Windows. We also give you choice in orchestration. You can see that both Swarm and Kubernetes are configured in this cluster. And Daniel, that third row, that's a new combination, right? Kubernetes and Windows support in Docker Enterprise. That's right. Building upon the foundation of Docker Enterprise 2.0, adding Kubernetes support, we've now added in Kubernetes support for Windows nodes as well. Excellent. OK, so let's go ahead and deploy this application. So since we're using a compose file, let's go into stacks. I'm going to say create a stack. Let's give it a name. We'll call it pet shop. We're going to deploy this using Kubernetes. I'll go ahead and use the default namespace. And let's upload the compose file that we were just looking at. OK, so we'll click create. Now, that's going to take a few moments for this application to spin up. And while it's spinning up, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the resources that are created with that application. So we'll go ahead and go into Kubernetes. Let's start with controllers. So the first part is the deployment. So we've got a deployment for both the database tier and the web tier. That, in turn, is going to create a couple replica sets. Uh, now, in the compose file, we didn't specify the number of replicas, so we're going to get a default of one. Ultimately, those replica sets will then be realized as pods in the cluster. So if we go to the pods screen, we can see those two pods. We've got the database and the web tier. Now, both of those are showing as running and healthy, uh, so the app should be up now. Now, in order to get to that app from outside of the system, you need to go through a load balancer. So let's take a look at our load balancers. Now you can see we've got a number of load balancers. Uh, specifically in this compose file, we didn't specify an external port number to use. So the system's going to pick a random available port. So if we inspect that load balancer, we can see the port number that's being used. We also have a convenient link to take us directly to the app. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. Now, Daniel, it is a 13-year-old app makes it a teenager. I don't know how many teenagers get going this quickly in the morning, but let's see what happens. Yes. Let's oh, OK. OK. There we go. Enough. There we go. All right. So we got the app up. So Daniel, we mm -hmm. deployed a .NET application, 13-year-old .NET application, without any changes to source code onto Windows using Kubernetes. Is that That's right? That's right. Agile teenagers. Agile, Who would have thought? Agile teenagers. <laughs> All right, so day two ops, right? Two that's ops. the next question. Yeah, that's right. So you, you and I both know it's easy enough to deploy an app, but day two, taking care, the ongoing feeding, update, maintenance. Can Docker Enterprise Edition help us with that? Absolutely, Scott. So with Docker Enterprise Edition, we also have choice around how you approach day two operations. You can use the graphical user interface, or you can use command line tools. So for this demo, we thought we'd show some of the capabilities of those command line interfaces. So let's go ahead and hop over into a terminal. 
Now, in this terminal, I've already downloaded a user certificate bundle against this cluster. So what that allows me to do, actually, let's go ahead and CD in there so you can see what's in there. So you can see we've got the certificates, uh, and we've got a couple environment files for different shells. Uh, now, in this environment, I happen to be running PowerShell, so I'm going to go ahead and use the import module command on that env.ps1 file. And what that's done is that set up my local environment so that any commands that I run locally are actually going to authenticate against that remote cluster uh, on behalf of this user account. Now, I should mention the user account that I'm using right now is configured as a view-only account for this production cluster. So let's see how far we can go with that view-only account to do some troubleshooting operations. OK? So let's start out with some Docker command line uh, operations. So let's maybe do a Docker node ls. So we can now see the same three nodes that we saw before in the GUI. Um, so we're able to see that same uh, set of information both from the CLI and from the GUI. Um, let's go ahead and say Docker stack ls. Again, we can see that we've deployed this as a stack. We can see that it's got two services running. All right, now I could continue to use Docker command line tools, but actually let's pivot a little bit and let's look at what the Kubernetes command line tools look like, OK? So let's try git pods. Again, same set of pods that we saw in the GUI. Um, now, let's say I'm troubleshooting. I'm trying to diagnose some problems or take some repair actions on this system. Um, we've got a two-tier app. Maybe there's some problems going on in the database tier. Uh, maybe I need to go run some low-level SQL commands to try to do some repair operations. Um, so one of the approaches that you can use to do that is to actually exec into the pod or container um, and start running commands directly within that environment. Now, that's kind of a sensitive operation, so let's see if we can actually do that with this view-only account. So we're going to go ahead and do an exec. Uh, I want interactive mode. I want TTY. Let's go ahead and copy and paste the name of the database pod. Now, again, remember, this is a Windows container or a Windows pod, so we're going to need to run a command that is actually valid inside of that environment. So let's go ahead and use PowerShell. Oh, whoa, whoa. Now, drama aside, Daniel, Docker Enterprise Edition did exactly what we wanted it to do, right? That's right. That's right. So this actually blocked this yeah. operation, which is a sensitive operation, which is exactly what we wanted. Uh, now, in this scenario, maybe this person does actually need to do some troubleshooting operations. Um, so maybe they'll pick up the phone, call the IT help desk, and say, hey, you know, this, we've got a production system that's down. I need to go troubleshoot it. Can you please give me temporary access? So let's go ahead and hop back into the GUI so we can see what that looks like. So we'll go back. Now we can see that I'm logged in as an administrative user in the system, which means I'm allowed to grant permissions to other users in the system. So let's go into user management. I'll go into grants. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new grant. So I'll pick my user. I'm going to go ahead and temporarily give that user full access or full control. And we're going to use the default namespace where we just deploy that application. <clears throat> All right, so we should be set. So Daniel, let me get this straight. Docker Enterprise Edition's authorization system allows us to set up authorizations once. And then those will be applied to both Swarm and Kubernetes, Windows and Linux? Is That's that right. right? That's right, Scott. So we've got a single pane of glass, and I can manage authorization across both orchestrators, so your Kubernetes workloads and your Swarm workloads, and across all of the operating systems, so both Windows and Linux. Single pane of glass. OK, so let's go ahead and hop back into the command line and see if that worked. So I'm going to run the exact same command that I just tried before. Demo God's cooperating. Oh, oh. And, and oh. we got a prompt. All right. OK, so prompt's a little boring. So let's actually prove that we are in the pod. Uh, so let's see. Uh, maybe I'll try to run some SQL commands. Uh, SQL CMD dash Q S P databases, I think. Daniel, I didn't know you were a DBA. Yeah, definitely not, Scott. I just play one on play TV. Play one on TV. All right. Well, <laughs> very good. Uh, all right. So we can see that we see the databases of this, inside of this pod uh, that obviously reflect the app that we're running. Uh, so at this point, I could run any SQL commands that I needed to to be able to do troubleshooting, repair tables, et cetera. That's awesome. So Daniel, we've given our users a lot more choices with this update to Docker Enterprise Edition, haven't we? That's right. That's right. Docker Enterprise is giving us a lot more choice here. So we've, we've demonstrated that you've got choice in the application definition format. Right? You can use the Kubernetes native formats, the YAML formats, or you can use Docker Compose. We've demonstrated that you've got choice in operating system. You can run both Windows and Linux in the same cluster. We've demonstrated choice in orchestrator. You can use both Swarm and Kubernetes in the same cluster. And now, coming up in, the, in this next release, you'll be able to use Kubernetes on top of Windows. Uh, we've also demonstrated day-to-operation choice. Mm. You can use GUIs. You can use CLIs. 
Uh, and if you choose to go down the CLI path, you also have flexibility and choice there. You can use the Docker command line tools and the Kubernetes command line tools. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I can tell our audience is excited to learn more and uh, get their hands on these new capabilities, Daniel. Uh, what might they do to do that? Great question, Scott. So we actually have a secret session later today, uh, early this evening. That secret session is actually a technical deep dive where we're going to go into a lot more detail on how all of this works. It's actually going to be co-presented by Microsoft and Docker engineers. So please go check that out. Um, and also, uh, there's a link on the page, or up on the screen, for beta.docker.com. Definitely encourage you to go check that out, sign up, uh, and as soon as a beta is available, you'll be able to get it. Excellent. Great demo, Daniel. Thank, Thank you. you. Roll back. Roll back one. Too late. It's, it's out there. That's all right. Um, in addition to operating systems, another area where IT ops requires choice is infrastructure in general and cloud infrastructure in particular. In fact, 85% of you have said that you're pursuing a multi-cloud strategy, meaning you're deploying hybrid, both on-premise and to a public cloud, and then you're also deploying to multiple public clouds. How many? Again, on average, you're saying you're deploying to 3.7 public clouds. Again. Because math, I can see my math geniuses in the audience smiling. But choice doesn't necessarily come for free. Different applications running on different clouds can result in inconsistent, non-standardized, fragmented processes, tooling, user management, security models, and more, such that any potential benefits from flexibility and choice are more than offset by the resulting complexity and friction. Wouldn't it be cool, wouldn't it be cool if we didn't have to trade off one for the other? If we didn't have to trade off choice for agility, or if we didn't have to trade off agility for choice? Well, guess what? Now, you don't have to. We are very excited to share with you new capabilities in Docker Enterprise Edition that enable cloud infrastructure choice without sacrificing operational agility. So to get us started, please join me in welcoming to the stage Alex Mavrianis. Alex. Thank you, Scott. Let's see what the demo guys have to say. Contain the past to free your future. Huh. Oh, more zen. Very thoughtful, that's yeah. A, that's a good, good to see you, Scott. Good, good to see you, Alex. How are you? Pretty good. So, Alex, I'm really excited about the new capabilities we're going to preview that make it even easier for IT operations to manage applications across multiple clusters, whether on-prem, in the cloud, or hybrid. So to kick us off, why don't you tell us a little bit about our app and where it's currently deployed? Sure. Here we have uh, PetStore. It is a legacy Java application we just modernized using Docker Enterprise Edition. It is composed of two tiers, a Java Spring web front-end tier and a MySQL database tier. It is currently deployed on a staging cluster managed by Docker Enterprise Edition and our on-prem uh, data center. This is the compose file of that application. And this is the interface of that staging cluster. If I go to shared resources and stacks, we'll be able to see that the stack is there and is using Kubernetes as an orchestrator. If we go to Kubernetes resources and specifically load balancers, we'll be able to see the services that map to the two tiers of our application. If we select the web publish service, we'll actually have access to an endpoint where we can go and view our application. This is the landing page of the application. We've added a logo in the bottom to indicate that it's currently running on our on-prem Docker Data Center, uh, Docker Enterprise Edition cluster. Excellent. Well, Alex, the bot in Slack just informed us that pet store staging is all complete, all green. Great. So let's migrate pet store from the staging on-prem cluster to the production cluster we have on the cloud. Excellent. Now, one of the new capabilities we're excited to share with you today 
is a technical preview of Docker Enterprise Edition's ability from a single pane of glass to manage multiple clusters, regardless of where they are, on-prem or on the cloud. Here we have the staging on-prem cluster where PetStore is currently deployed. And we've already provisioned a Docker Enterprise Edition cluster in the cloud as a production environment. Let's see how we can manage applications across these clusters. We're going to hop over to Applications, choose Pet Store, and here we can see the details of our application. On the bottom right side, we have the same Compose file we viewed earlier. And if we view Clusters, we'll be able to see that, indeed, it's currently deployed only in our staging on-prem cluster mm -hmm. as of now. So let's now migrate our application from that on-prem Docker, Docker Enterprise Edition cluster to our production cluster on the cloud. Let's do it. I'm going to select the Migrate option, choose the origin cluster to be on-prem, the target cluster to be the one on the cloud, and I'm going to simply select Migrate. And that was it. If I go to, back to clusters, clusters oh. we'll see that right now it's showing us deployed on the cloud. And if we access the endpoint over here, it will take us to our application, which ah. now shows it's being deployed there it is. on the cloud. All right. Alex. Alex, that's cool. But that looked almost too easy. We were able to take our legacy Java application, move it from our on-prem staging cluster to our cloud production cluster without making any changes to the application and without having to make any configuration changes to the infrastructure. Is that right? That's right. Docker Enterprise Edition gives you a dashboard that you can use to manage multiple clusters and move applications across them. It, it just works. Wow. Wow, that's super cool. Now, Alex, um, I know that that cloud cluster actually is on the East Coast. And just before we came on stage, I heard that there's a hurricane coming up from Florida. Um, as we want to make sure our pet store service is always available for our customers, how about we replicate the app uh, to a West Coast data center, West Coast Cloud data center? Um, but last I checked, we hadn't actually stood up a full Docker Enterprise Edition stack on the West Coast. That's right, but it's not a problem, Scott. Docker Enterprise Edition can already take advantage of cloud providers' infrastructure as a service. And there's an exciting new capability that allows Docker Enterprise Edition to also take advantage of cloud providers hosted Kubernetes services. Hmm. Let's take a look. Yeah. So I'm going to onboard an Amazon EKS cluster on, located on uh, the West Coast into Docker Enterprise Edition. I'm going to use this script over here, which will get us access to the, AK, to the EKS cluster. And I'm going to use this Kubernetes command to verify that, indeed, we are communicating with a, a cluster on AWS. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to run just a simple command which will join our cluster. And that was it. Boom. Wow. Now, what this command did is it ran an agent of Docker Enterprise Edition into this cluster that allows it to be managed in the same way as the mm. previous clusters that we saw. Cool. If we hop back to the list of clusters we had on the interface, you can see that we have our AKS. Oh, cluster. There it is. All right. Excellent. Now, let's deploy our application to it. We're going to go back to Applications, choose Pet Store. This time, we're going to select Deploy. And we're going to choose the EKS cluster and select Deploy from there. That was it. Now, if we go to the clusters for that application, you oh, see that it's it deployed is. both on the Cloud cluster Excellent. and on the EKS cluster. And if we access the endpoint of our application and give it a couple of refreshes, we should eventually be able to see one of the replicas on EKS responding to our application. Demo God's willing. Let's see if that happens. Hey, all right. There we go. So again, Alex, that looked, that looked really easy. We were able to onboard an Amazon EKS cluster into Docker Enterprise Edition, deploy our legacy Java application to it, and then load balance traffic across the East Coast and West Coast instances. Is that right? That's right. Wow. That's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So Alex, watching this, um, you know, it's great that we're able to get multiple application instances up and running for high availability. But we really should double check and make sure that it's really available for our customers when they go to try it out, right? Because anything could happen these days. We could have a hurricane on the East Coast, earthquake on the West. What do you think? Sure. 
uh, what I can do is I can tear down the application on our East Coast cloud cluster. To do that, I'm going to hop over to the interface for that cluster. I'm going to go over to Shared Resources and Stacks. And I'm simply going to remove the application from here to simulate that a failure has occurred. Now, if we go back to the endpoint of our application and we give it a refresh, we'll see that. Yeah, the app, all right. The app is all right. Running. Excellent. Right there. Excellent. So it was, in fact, highly available. We were able to make yeah. our Pet Store app highly available with a couple of clicks, and we just validated it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. You know, Alex, we're actually running ahead of schedule. We've been so efficient. Um, let's, let's knock off one of our other to dos. Sure. Um, this one concerns how our application handles uh, information our customers give us, the personally identifiable information, or PII, in a way such that it conforms with the data sovereignty regulations of the different countries in which we operate, GDPR, for example. Um, so we're going to have to uh, deploy Pet Store in specific clouds, in specific countries in which we operate, where our customers reside. So how about for our European customers, we deploy to Azure in the Netherlands? Mm -hmm. And then how about for our Japanese customers, we deploy to Google Cloud in Tokyo? Now, can Docker Enterprise Edition help us with that as well? Sure. Let me show you. I'm going to hop over to a new terminal session, and I'm going to use the Azure command line tool to gain access to an AKS cluster. Going to run the same command to verify that the list of nodes is indeed the nodes of an AKS cluster. Here they are. And I'm going to run the same join command as before to launch the same agent and uh, onboard our AKS cluster in the Netherlands. And that was it. Now let's do the same for our GKE cluster. I'm going to use a Google Cloud command line tool. I'm going to launch the same command to verify that we're indeed communicating with GKE. Here it is. And I'm going to join it as our GKE cluster in Japan. That was it. So now, if we go back to the user interface and go to the list of clusters we had, ah, see there all you the go. clusters up here. Onboarded. Excellent. Now let's deploy our application across them. We're going to go back to Applications, Pet Store, select Deploy. We're going to choose these two new clusters. And in fact, we can choose as many clusters as we want and can simultaneously deploy across all of them with a single click of a button. Cool. Let's do just that. Let's do it. Going to select Deploy. And that was pretty much it. If we go to clusters, ah, we'll see our application across all of them. There we go. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Alex, you know, obviously the next step is we're going to have to geo-route this traffic. But before we do that, maybe we should just double check and make sure the applications are, in fact, up on every one of those clusters. Can we do that? Sure. We can just go to the same endpoint and try to load balance across them. Going to give it a couple of refreshes. This All is right. There's the Azure cluster. All right. Let's see if we can get the demo gods. And there's the Google page. cluster. Excellent. Excellent. That's cool, Alex. But let me get this straight. Before this new capability in Docker Enterprise Edition, application teams would have had met to have to manage apps on each cloud or cluster separately in separate silos with different tools, different processes, different management, and so on, right? That's right. But now with Docker Enterprise Edition and this new capability, we've showed how we can onboard hosted Kubernetes clusters from the public clouds, federate application management across multiple clusters, whether they're on-prem, a cloud's IaaS, or hosted Kubernetes, all through a single pane of glass that enables IT operation teams to manage their applications and have infrastructure choice without sacrificing operational agility. Is that right? Yeah, isn't that cool? That's very cool. Right? That's very cool, right? <laughs> all right, Alex, I can tell our audience also wants to get their hands on this great new functionality. Uh, where can they go? Easy, just go to beta.docker.com and sign up for the upcoming beta. Excellent. Well, that's a great start to day one of DockerCon. Alex, great demo. Thanks so much. Everyone, have a fantastic first day. Have a great day.